Now, how many of you have read Mary Norris's Between You and Me, which came out a few years ago? That's quite, quite a few. Uh, well, if you enjoyed the wit and personality of that book, you'll be glad to know the same elements are very present in her new book, uh, Greek to Me. Uh, we read in her previous book about Mary's passion for grammar, uh, which she got to indulge as a longtime uh, copy reader at the, um, uh, at the uh, New Yorker magazine. Another passion of hers, it turns out, is Greek. And her new book is an enthusiastic, erudite, and entertaining uh, pan to all things Greek. It all began when her dad thwarted Mary from learning Latin in grade school. So later, she turned to Greek and was helped along the way by uh, what turns out to be a New Yorker policy that pays tuition for classes with some bearing on an employee's work. Her book is part personal history, part cultural primer, and part travelogue. It delves into the, the history of the Greek language and the ways it's influenced English. Uh, retells the uh, classical myths in fresh and intriguing ways, and recounts Mary's own travels through Greece, uh, where she's uh, followed the, the trails of her Greek muses, whether mythical, ancient, or contemporary, while sampling ouzo and olives and, well, let us say, drawing her share of male attention. Uh, Mary will be in conversation uh, here uh, with Deborah Tannen, uh, who I'm sure also is familiar to many of you as she's uh, very familiar to us here at PNP. Uh, Deborah is a, a linguistics professor at Georgetown University and an accomplished author herself, including of the now classic You Just Don't Understand, and her uh, most recent, You're the Only One uh, I Can Tell. Uh, but here's something not widely known about Deborah. Before she received her degree in linguistics, she wrote a book about the work of a modern Greek writer for the Twain World Author Series, Malika Nakos. Uh, finally, uh, if, if you of you heard me say this uh, uh, about uh, 20 or 25 minutes ago, but I'll repeat it for those of you who've come, um, uh, uh, come since, uh, our thanks uh, goes to the Greek Embassy for, for joining PNP in this event. Um, and I don't know if they're also here to help you with your visas, but you could, <laughs> you could check afterwards. Um, uh, the embassy has provided some goodies, uh, which you may see some uh, already have partaken, uh, including uh, cheese, breadsticks, sesame seed candies, and red and white wine, all from the island of Crete, and all for everyone. So please feel free to partake, or as they say over there, stine yasas. <laughs> that means to your health, I think. Um, anyway, now please join me in welcoming Mary Norris and Deborah Tannen. Hi everyone, what a wonderful turnout. Uh, um, yeah, what a, what a joy to have a chance to talk to Mary Norris about her book and to have read the book. It is wonderful. Um, it is really a love letter to Greece, to Greek, the Greek language, Greek mythology, and the Greek alphabet. Um, you write that anyone who loves language loves the alphabet. Um, and you write so engagingly about the Greek alphabet. Um, so why don't we just start there? Tell us about that. Well, hello, everybody. It's wonderful to see so many smiling faces here. Um, I thought it was appropriate to begin with the alphabet, both our discussion and also the book. Um, I, there's a, an invocation, a brief introduction, and then um, I insisted while working with my editor that we start with the alphabet, thinking that if I taught the alphabet first, I could put a whole lot of Greek in the book and people would understand it. Um, well, it turns out that it's just devilishly hard to write about the alphabet. Everybody know how, knows how it ends. 
<clears throat> and the temptation is to write about it in alphabetical order. You know, alpha is for Athena, B is for Beta, and you get, I got really bored at around Lambda. I thought, let's skip on down. And I started, went right for those letters that Greek has that English does not. The, um, well, C is one. Taxi looks almost exactly the same in Greek as it does in English, except the X is the letter C, which is three bars instead of our X. Our X is called chi or key in Greek. And there's also psi, the one that looks like a pitchfork and is the first letter in psychology and all of those wonderful words that come to us from psyche. And um, phi, which is for feta. Right? Uh, anyway, I tried just squeezing those letters in, and even that, I have to admit, was very boring. And eventually, I had to build my whole chapter on the Greek alphabet around the single letter chi. <laughs> anyway, there was a, there's a lot also about the original librarians of Alexandria who codified a lot of the Greek language for us and through whom we have a lot of the texts and we wouldn't have them without that library of Alexandria. So you know, the, the Greek alphabet is our ancestral alphabet and it should be of interest to everyone. I actually have acquired a set of Greek alphabet blocks. I did not bring them with me today, but um, there it's a delight to be able to play with with blocks just as when I was a child. I really enjoyed handling these things. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I love the way you read about it and point out that each letter or character has a character, um, has its own character. And that just captured for me how your um, you write about things in such a playful uh, as well as um, insightful way. Um, I just wanted to say one thing that reminded me when you said that about the character, um, was it Georgetown? The first Greek fraternity was founded, I think. Was it? I think you said William and Mary. William and Mary. I knew it was around here someplace, yes. <laughs> um, and it was founded by a man who was not admitted to a study group that had a Latin name, so he won up them by founding a new study group and giving it a Greek name, and that was Phi Beta Kappa. All of the fraternity system descends from that. Um, you talk also uh, wonderfully about Greek mythology and um, say that you have a favorite uh, figure from Greek mythology, and that is Athena. Uh, so maybe you even want to read that bit about where you start writing about Athena and then talk a little bit about um, what she represents to you and why she's your favorite. Well, I grew up in the age of the great cheesy Hollywood movies about the classics. And my first exposure to Greek mythology was at the Lyceum, not the famed Lycaon in Athens, where Aristotle and his pupils strolled around as they discussed beauty and philosophy, but a movie theater on Fulton Road in Cleveland, Ohio, <laughs> where my brothers and I spent Saturday afternoons. The Lyceum was classic as opposed to classical. Popcorn in red and white striped boxes, a stern lady usher who confiscated the candy we snuck in from outside, buzzers under the seats for a gimmicky thrill. Every week, the Lyceum showed a double feature, usually a horror movie, The Mummy, Godzilla, the creature from the Black Lagoon, paired with something mildly pornographic and highly educational. At one Saturday matinee, I laid eyes for the first time on The Cyclops. The movie was Ulysses, 1955, starring Kirk Douglas as the man of many turnings. In a way, it too was a horror movie full of monsters and apparitions, a witch who turned men into pigs, sea serpents, Anthony Quinn in a short, tight skirt. <laughs> Ulysses is the Latinate, Latinate name for Odysseus and the one preferred by Hollywood and James Joyce. How Odysseus became Ulysses is, like many things that happened between Greece and Rome, impossible to say for sure. Scholars have suggested that the D or delta 
of Odysseus in Ionic Greek was originally L or Lambda in the Dorian and Aeolic dialects. Delta and Lambda are similar in form, a wedge with or without a bar, but to my knowledge no one has suggested that Odysseus was the ancient equivalent of a typo for Ulysses. The name may have reached Rome independently as Ulixes through Sicily, the traditional home of the Cyclops. Now it was actually the Cyclops that struck my fancy <laughs> when I first laid eyes on him. Athena must have appeared in the movie. What is the Odyssey without Athena? She is the protector of Ulysses. He would not survive without her. Surely the hero invokes her. I must have heard her name, but I don't recall meeting Homer's gray-eyed goddess at the Lyceum. Perhaps the spirit of Athena hovered over Lake Erie. <laughs> So Athena struck me when I got to know her. First of all, I loved Odysseus. And if you're in love with Odysseus, you are very grateful to Athena. And Athena seems to be a little in love with Odysseus. And I wanted Athena on my side at any cost. So, and growing up, I had um, not that many models. I had my mother as a model of um, femininity, um, a woman. And, I, and there were nuns. So <laughs> there were no great models of an independent woman uh, until I got to The New Yorker, at where I worked for some 30 years. And there I began to find wonderful editors and wonderful writers and proofreaders of all kinds, some, some mad and some just gracious and sane. And I hope I was able to find the model that made me not one of the completely mad ones. Um, but it turned out that, to me that Athena seemed like a really good model because she wouldn't, you know, when you're in that position, um, proofreading, copy editing, writers who are some of them important, some of them a little defensive, it always turned out, by the way, that the best writers were the most interested in being copy edited and proofread. They really wanted your feedback. The lesser writers were defensive and would fight you <laughs> on things. And Athena was a good model because she wouldn't put up with anything from anybody. She wouldn't care whether a writer liked her or not. And she would just trust her instincts with the language. And so at one point, I did find this, um, I, I knew that the um, that Athena wore the head of the Medusa on her breast as a kind of a, a brooch that <laughs> held her aegis together. And I found a, a print of the Medusa in a museum, you know, with the snake hair and sticking her tongue out. I, I won't do my imitation of the Medusa right now. <laughs> but I had that print um, pinned above my desk. <laughs> Um, yeah, so Athena as the model of an uh, independent woman. Um, your book is wonderful on language. Every, anyone who has love of language of alphabet will love it. But it's also wonderful in your description of your travels in Greece. And I was so full of admiration that you mostly like to travel alone. Um, so could you, and, and that kind of like Athena, um, just talk a little bit and you do comment in the book as well about the both the advantages and then maybe some drawbacks of a woman traveling alone. Well, the main reason I traveled alone in the beginning was that I had been cooped up for so long in Ohio without travel that anywhere I that wherever I went, I wanted to see everything within you know 500 mile radius. So my first trip to Greece, went from Athens to Crete to Rhodes to Cyprus, back up the Turkish coast to Istanbul, over to Thessaloniki, down and around Delphi and the Peloponnese back to Athens over the course of five weeks. Nobody would do that with me. <laughs> <laughs> I was on my own, you know, because I had to be. Uh, but I did discover even before that when I went to England by myself and I stayed in London, um, 
when you're by yourself, you talk to people, you know, otherwise you go crazy or, or you start striking up conversations with the cashier at the grocery store, you know, just to hear your voice get out of your own head and carry on. And I discovered in London that the best days were the ones when I talked to people, when I went out and, you know, I wouldn't say I made friends, but I, people were friendly and I had some interaction. And I, I still, you know, I travel with friends who want to go to Greece. I enjoy doing that. I travel I, um, Italy with friends. One of those friends is here tonight. So I travel from New York to Washington with friends. But I did discover that when I travel with someone from home, I can't get out of my own idiom. You know, I, I'm always with the person who I have a relationship with, and I find myself a little bit a little bit limited by what they already know about me you know for instance um oh this this friend knows i would never go into a bakery and order eight brownies or you know, something like that um so i'm i'm a little bit more the way i am at home when i'm with a friend from home in a foreign country but when I'm by myself, nobody knows me, you know, so I really can make myself up as I go along. And especially when you're working in um, a foreign language, um, I always think that when you travel, it's good to learn a little of the language of the country that you're going to. And my, my knowledge of Greek was so rudimentary that I couldn't, you know, nobody expected me to carry on any small talk. I'm not good at small talk, but I had enough Greek to ask for the necessities. You know, I could, I could ask, does the elevator work? Um, I could ask for a ticket for a ship or if there was a room or is this ship really coming? <laughs> and I remember the answer to that, Tharthi. It will come. <laughs> those things, those are the things that I can't stick. say when. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I was hoping you would say that wonderful line that when you travel alone, you can make yourself up as you go along. It's, that's, that's really, really wonderful. Um, so there are so many wonderful stories, but one that I particularly love, and it's short, but could you just describe briefly, I mean, it is brief, what happened in that village where you asked for gas? Ah, uh, <laughs> yes, I... I was in Cyprus and had rented a car. It was all very confusing because they do drive on the left. They have that British heritage. But some other things they do in um, a different way. It was all very confusing. Um, and something rattled me. I had to get out of town fast. <laughs> So I left. I forgot to get gas. And I practiced how to say it. Apu boro na agapaso pet, what's benzina. benzina, benzina. Where may I buy gas? And I picked up a hitchhiker. <laughs> and, um, no, I didn't. I just found a guy in the village, and I asked him where I could buy gas, and he got in the car. That's how it happened. <laughs> he appointed himself hitchhiker. And he took me to the, the coffee shop, the Café Neon, which is where the man who had gas was. <laughs> and then all the guys in the coffee shop led me to where he kept the cans of gas. I was driving, and they were walking around the car. Like, <laughs> It was like being in a parade. And we got to the, the place where they had the gas and came in two sizes, large and small, uh, the cans. And he put the cans in. He, I picked the big one. And um, he filled up my tank. And then, you know, they waved me out of town. I remember all of the men, you know, waving as I went off <laughs> to the next village. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I love that story. I puboro na agarraso benzino. Okay, now you know. <laughs> I'm going to read a, just a line that I just particularly love, and maybe you want to comment. Uh, so you're discussing the, um, the sentiment of nostalgia, nostalgia, which comes, of course, from Greek, nostos, the longing for home. And you comment, nostalgia may mean a yearning for a place, but it's also a yearning for a time when you were in that place. 
and therefore for the you of the past. I thought that was, and so many, so much of what you write here just would make me stop and think that explains so much. Um, and I think so many of us have places we love to go back to. Certainly, I feel that way about Greece. And you write about this at the end about going back to Greece. Um, but I don't know, maybe just say a few more things about your thoughts about how being in a place and speaking a certain language is a way of both getting outside yourself and being inside yourself in a deeper way. Well, that's kind of a tall order. Um, I will say that in traveling and in trying to speak a foreign language, um, and this is a part of traveling alone too, you know, you, you get to a point where you feel alienated. You don't know anyone, you're an alien there, and that's good. Um, I think it's, I feel that especially as a writer, it's really hard to write about anything unless you can get a little distance on it. So that feeling of alienation gives you a view of the place you're in that you can't have of the place you live all the time or that the people who live there can't have because they're there all the time. So when I was, the last time I was in Greece in 2017, I got to stay for three full months. Um, my first trip in 1983 was five weeks, and I went to the Aegean, and I hopped between islands. If I stayed someplace for three days, I thought that was a long time. So I only, you know, I saw the, the Aegean Islands briefly. I fell in love with the sea in that eastern part of the Aegean. And when I um, left The New Yorker, when I retired in 2017, and people said, oh, what are you going to do when you retire? You're going to have some adjusting to do it. I'm going to Greece. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I went for three months to the Aegean, and then I spent, so I could spend an entire month in, uh, on Rhodos and um, Patmos, and then traveling around a little, and finally getting to go. I'd never been before to Mykonos. I'd always been a little worried because it's so cosmopolitan, and I would feel, oh well, extra alienated. <laughs> I didn't need to feel extra alienated. Um, but from there, you can visit the island of Delos, which is this open air museum devoted to Apollo. So at the end of that trip, I, I wound up in Cardamili in the Mani which is where Patrick Lee Fermer lived. Yes, I got to see that house, get a little tour of it. And I spent about a week just hanging out in Cardamili. And I could see across the Gulf of Messenia, I think it is, to the island, to the um, to Messenia, the leg of the Peloponnese. There's three peninsulas down there where Nestor lived. Nestor, who went to Troy, with the Achaeans as their counselor. And I don't, I'm not sure whether, well, this has to be a deliberate thing that happens in the Odyssey. You know, whenever they get, whenever Homer turns to Nestor, you, oh, time to nod off here. <laughs> Nestor always goes on and on. You know, he holds up the chariot race to give his son advice that the son doesn't need. And, he, and when uh, Telemachus comes to visit, um, Nestor to get news of his father, you know, the guy talks and talks, and he finally says to the son, look, when we get back, let's just, just take me right to the boat, okay? <laughs> um, otherwise, your father will want to give gifts and pack a lunch, and it'll take forever. So, But one of the things I think is true about the Odyssey is that this was probably teaching people how to be nice to their elders. No one ever made fun of Nestor. I don't think in the Odyssey, so they're all very, very sweet to him. Anyway, this is a roundabout way of saying that at the end of my trip, I was homesick. I was ready to go home. I felt what uh, I think Odysseus felt. I, what the Odyssey is, in a way, um, oh, it's got to be the first instance of nostalgia, of homesickness. Nostos is, is home. Al Alja is pain or sort of sickness, the word was actually invented by a German, it turns out, who put those two roots together to form nostalgia. <clears throat> and you know, one of the things you learn when you travel is that you're from where you're from. You may think you, you will find comfort on Ithaca, but probably only if you're Ithacan. 
Um, I had a very sweet homecoming from that trip, and I will never forget how wonderful it was to get back to my own bed. You write so movingly about the sea and talk about how you had actually mm -hmm. never seen the ocean before you went to Dr. Carol Douglas mm -hmm. the College, having gone to Ohio. I could hear her fine. Can you hear now? Can you hear now? Yes. yes. I think I pushed the button by mistake. Thank you. Yeah, I was saying that uh, Mary writes so movingly about uh, seeing this about the sea in Greece, but also the excitement of seeing the ocean for the first time, going to college at Douglas. Uh, yes. Yeah. My natal body of water was Lake Erie. And I remember being set down by its side on a very slimy beach, really, it was all seaweed, and not liking it a bit. And not seeing the ocean until I was a freshman in college, I went to college in New Jersey at Rutgers, Douglas College of Rutgers, and I met somebody there, a native New Jerseyite, who, when she found out I'd never seen the ocean, said, I'm getting a car, we're taking you there. So I saw the Atlantic Ocean. Um, what the, what's that place where um, Bruce Springsteen is from? Asbury Park. That was the first <laughs> place I saw the ocean from, the um, boardwalk at Asbury Park. And I remember walking it and realizing you know, the ocean was on the right. I knew that was east. And that was, you know, that just oriented me to the entire continent, reoriented me because in Cleveland, the lake was always north. Um, <laughs> And so I, I automatically knew that I was walking north and the ocean was on my east. And I've always been drawn to places that had the sea. As a proofreader at the New Yorker, I had terrible eye strain, for one thing. I had to read a lot of very tiny print. And one of the things I really loved to do on vacations was look at the farthest horizon. And Greece offered, you know, blue upon blue. And I learned how to kind of haze things out so I could see all the bands of different shades of blue at the edge of the earth. I'm going to ask one more. That would be such a great place to stop. But I'm going to ask one more question. Um, and then after that, we'll open it for your questions. Those who have questions, it's important that you go to one of these two microphones. So if you already know you have a question, you might start lining up at the microphones now. And I should mention that it is being filmed because it will be available on the, uh, on the Politics and Prose um, website. Uh, so my last question, I have more of a pick, pick which one I most want to ask here. Um, so many things that you write about so beautifully. But here's one um, that you capture how when you speak a new language, you see things in a new way. It makes everything seem new and that it's freeing. And you say, you write, Greek, Greek has been my salvation. Greek was my therapy, my release from my, my relief from my native tongue and the life that went with it. So maybe a couple words about that while people are thinking about the questions they may have. Well, if you've ever studied a foreign language, you know that it comes with a whole different mindset. You know, um, the way, for instance, in German, in English, we capitalize the I, the personal pronoun I. In German, ich is lowercase, but Z, formal U, is capitalized. And that has to say something about people's relationships with each other. So in Greek, what I found when I started studying it was, um, you know, to memorize anything, you try to make an association, right? And a uh, mnemonic device, and that's a good Greek word there from pneumosyne, the mother of the muses, memory. Um, my first two words in Greek, in modern Greek, were ilios, which is the sun, and ευχαριστώ, thank you. Ilios. I thought of Helios, who we know as the sun god. And in the original Greek, I guess Helios was the sun god. But that it's still the word just for the sun kind of exalts it to my mind. 
And the same with the word Evcaristo. If you look at how it's spelled, it looks like Eucharist, E-U-C-H-A-R-I-S-T. And in Greek, this is just thanks. In English, the Eucharist is one of the great mysteries at the heart of Christianity, the, you know, the, where the body and blood of Christ turns in, where the blood, you know, you know, bread and wine become <laughs> body and blood. It's just huge. It's really, and, and that they toss this word around all the time in Greece. It just seemed like it was elevating everyday life. And really, that's how I feel when I go to Greece. Everything feels heightened to me, and everything about the language also is very beautiful, very heightened. So it was, I think it was my salvation for, for personal reasons. I was um, slaving away at my copy desk job, and I needed something um, beyond, beyond English. I wasn't getting published in English, so who needed it, you know, for a while. I would try to adopt Greek instead. I wrote, um, you know, my real ambition was to be a, a poet in Greek, to be a Greek poet. That would be, you know, the maker of things. So as anyone has a question, please come to the microphone. And while they're getting there, I'll just make a quick comment. Um, sort of building on what you just said, that when you hear people simply translating from their language to your language, it's poetry. I remember the first time I heard somebody say in Greek, the moon is upstairs. <laughs> oh, I thought that's so poetic. And then really learned that the word for upstairs and up there is the same in Greek. <laughs> Open for questions. We can keep talking. What an opportunity. <laughs> You have to go to the mic. Hi, is this Hi. on? Yes. <laughs> Thank you for coming, first of all. Could you talk a little bit about how you made the transition from copy reader to, to writer? Sure. Um, I came, I always wanted to be a writer. So it is almost more the other way around. Uh, I needed, if you've ever tried to write for a living, you know you cannot live on $60 a year. <laughs> so I had to find some way to pay the rent and I thought you know, I admired the New Yorker from a distance and I was able to get an um, entry level job there in what is called the editorial library and I thought well I'll just work here and I'll write and I'll get published um, it didn't work out quite that way I worked in the editorial library for three years. There was an opening at one point on the copy desk, and I thought, well, if it's got to do with language, I would be interested in doing it, and I would enjoy it. Maybe I, I would certainly be better at that than I am at waiting tables, because I was a very bad wait, wait person. Huh? Um, but what happened when there was, it was an opening? I applied for it and said um, that I would be ideal because I'd never worked as a copy editor before and I wouldn't have to unlearn anything. And you know, <laughs> the New Yorker is very fussy. That didn't work. <clears throat> but at another point, there was an opening. I got a job in something called collating where I learned what copy editors and proofreaders do. And then I moved to the copy <coughs> desk. All this while I was writing, I wrote, I tried to write talk stories. I got a few talk stories published. One of them, one of the first ones was called Divine's Funeral, it was about going to the um, funeral of Divine. And we just passed through Towson, Maryland on the way here today. And I remember that and I got excited. A um, few talk stories, but <clears throat> I was not a staff writer. And the longer I was at the New Yorker, the more those opportunities went to staff writers and freelancers just kind of had to wait their turn for an opening. I wrote um, a novel. I worked for a long time on a novel. You've not heard of it. <laughs> <clears throat> and then I, wo I wrote, I started a book about nuns, the nuns that, I, that taught me in high school. Um, they, it was in, during the Second Vatican Council, and they changed their names and changed back out of their habits. And I thought that would be a good book, how, what happened to them. 
Uh, it took me a year to hear back from a literary agent about that, and the answer was, I don't think I can do a book about none. So that went nowhere. Then I wanted to write a memoir of having a transgender sibling. And I thought, well, this is interesting for sure. And uh, apparently not. <laughs> uh, I had trouble placing that too. And the only, when I finally had a breakthrough, I'd been on the, I'd been, um, putting commas in and taking commas out for 30 years. And I was asked by someone who worked on the website to respond to an article about commas that was in the New York Times that made fun of New Yorker commas. And somebody had to come to the defense of the New Yorker comma. I did not want to write about commas. But I was it. That was, you know, nobody else had a, any little bit of a reputation as a writer at the New Yorker. And I ought to know something about commas after all that time. So that when that went up on the website of the New Yorker, I, who knew? Who knew that there were so many people interested in what went on backstage at the New Yorker? So that's... And I'd been writing all along. It just took me a really long time to catch a break. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the next two question askers here are rather young. Can you reach the microphone or maybe take it out of its? Yeah, perfect. How and why did you get interested in Greek stuff? I wish I had two voices that I could answer that with. <laughs> How and why did I get interested in Greek itself? <clears throat> My first interest was in the landscape because I saw a movie called Time Bandits. A lot of this is about cheesy movies, but um, in the movie there is this band of little people who travel into the past to plunder treasure. And one of the places they go is ancient Greece, and who is there but Sean Connery, <laughs> who is a very handsome actor. You probably wouldn't be interested in him. No, um, but he was playing Agamemnon, who was a great Greek warrior, and he was shown on this plane battling the Minotaur, guy with a head like a bull. And what captured my attention was the background was so elemental. It was just um, you know, plain uh, rocky earth and blue, blue sky. And, and I thought, oh, I want to go there. Turns out that movie was shot in Morocco. <laughs> so this whole thing has been a huge detour. <clears throat> but I went into the office the next day and I told my boss there, that I had decided to go to Greece, and he had been to Greece a lot. So he showed me on a map where he had gone, and he took a tour. He went on a cruise, and I would never do that. <laughs> but um, then he got a book out of his, his bookcase that said modern Greek, um, it was a, mo a modern Greek for beginners. And he, you know, he opened it, it was all in Greek, and he started reading it out loud and translating it. Now, you can read that? So that's what got me really interested in studying Greek. I thought, you know, you can go to Greece and meet people who speak English and have a, a fine time, but a little bit of Greek goes a long way. And I fell in love with it because of those words. You know, I... I it all was a little bit different than I expected. Um, you hear a lot about the light in Greece, and I thought it would be a blinding light. I thought it was bright, but it's not. It's a beautiful, soft light that just kind of creates glows around the things it bounces off of. So it was very beautiful. Is that okay? Is that a good enough answer? Yeah. <laughs> have I ever been to Paros? Yes, I have been to Paros. Paros is a very um, advanced island. It has beautiful restaurants. <laughs> and it's all wired. You can get Wi-Fi there. And it has be beautiful beaches as well. Are you from Paros? How do you? Okay. 
Oh, you go to Paros every year. Well, you are she said very this, lucky. Uh, young woman said she's part Greek and part Indian and goes to Greece every year. Thank you for your questions. They were great. <laughs> we'll take one on this side and then that side. Yeah. So you've, you've talked about how you feel when you engage in a different language, in a different culture. And um, and I've, I've always been mystified by people who sometimes actually don't feel good when they hear another language or when they're confronted with another culture. And do you have any advice? How can we get people to open up to that, both the, the discomfort and that it you feel when you're faced with something that's unfamiliar and also the invitation to an exotic new world that awaits you if you really open yourself up to um, other cultures and other languages i wish i had the key to that one i remember studying uh traveling in mexico and running into my first truly ugly American who was on a bus and she was complaining because they wanted cheese and all there was was this stuff called Quaso. <laughs> if, they, if they had cheese, they should have just told us it was cheese. What is this Quaso? <laughs> So I know there are um, there are a lot of ugly Americans out there who, when they go someplace, they just want what they have at home. They want the comfort of their their coffee or their tea or their nap or their toilet. You know. So I say stay home. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, um, learning another language involves. Yeah, for me, it's all about making mistakes. It involves really humbling yourself. And some people have a harder time doing that than others. Um, so, you know, you can just, I don't know how you tell people, you know, you're not king. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and also, you know, just opening, a lot of people have an automatic freezing response when they hear something they don't understand going on or they hear, you know, Chinese or some um, Portuguese, some language that sounds funny. Um, let I, you know, I would say just let it let it enter your head. Let those sounds enter your head, and admit you're not going to understand them now. But maybe you'll develop an interest. Sorry, I, if I knew the answer to that, I would have you know world peace. <laughs> uh, after I finished college, which was a long time ago, uh, I uh, went and one of the things I did was to hitchhike around Greece for about uh, five weeks, and it was a magical time, particularly Delphi, when I got up one morning and it was misty and I could really feel as if the oracle was there somewhere. But I thought I'd go back, but uh, it hasn't happened, and now I'm sort of afraid to go back because I think it will be so touristy. Um, are there places or is there a place where one can go now and feel that you really are in Greece surrounded by the gods? Well, I'm sure there are places. I, I did not have your experience in Delphi. I had a wonderful experience there, though, with um, involving a guard at the Athena temple. Um, <clears throat> it already sounds dirty. <laughs> <laughs> he gave me a few little chips of stone from the sanctuary, which I still have and I hold dear. I'm sure there, you know, there are how many islands? There are. A thousand islands. Um, I would say that you might want to pick some place that has a reputation for not having so many tourists. But a lot of places, even the Greeks go to, uh, Kefalonia is a beautiful place. I would like to go to some place called Sifnos, which I have, I don't know anyone who's been to. Folegandros is another one. You probably have some ideas too. Both, both Sifnos and Fodegandros have been to and they're wonderful. Yeah, you can find places that are less touristy. Mm -hmm. And you go at a different time, you know, go in winter, 
Mm-hmm. And you'll have Delphi all to yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. There's nobody there, so. Yeah, I was wondering how the um, Latin alphabet changed from the Greek alphabet, if they're from the same source. And I was also wondering why in most European countries, the word for yes is similar, but in Greek, the word for yes is nay. And I find this very odd. And I just wonder why. I don't think mine is to actually answer why. But I can start with your first question about the alphabet. The Greek alphabet came from the Phoenicians. And they added the vowels. That was the Greek genius. Uh, The Phoenicians didn't have any vowels. They just had little grunts. And I'm not supposed to say that, especially (laughs) with a linguist at my side. (coughs) I'm off duty. Are there any Phoenicians in the audience? (laughs) So they developed the vowels, and they also add letters that they added that um, the C, the T, the F, um, that they didn't, they add in their language. And of course, the alphabet is supposed to represent the sounds in the language. So the Greeks added those. Then the alphabet went through the Etruscans who were traders in the Mediterranean. It was all about trading from the Phoenicians, but it was the, the Greeks who added poetry. They, there is a theory that they developed the alphabet, written language, at the same time that they wrote down Homer for the first time so that the uh, Homeric epics could travel farther in distance and in time all the way to us. And then the Romans, when they developed that alphabet, the Latin alphabet, uh, they dropped some of the letters that they didn't use. And um, the, you know, the, the ones that I talked about before, the psi, the chi, and they added a few, I think C, J, H, and um, And then later they realized they needed the Z after all. And so they put it on at the end. In the Greek alphabet, the Z, zeta is the sixth letter. They use it quite a lot. So that is where we get our alphabet is from the Latin or the Roman alphabet. The English alphabet comes from that. And your second question. Yeah, why is it that the Greek word is nay? And it sounds so much... Like no. And the word for no, okay, sounds like okay. Yeah. You know, so it is confusing. <laughs> um, I'm sure that this is probably uh, wrong, but the Greek word for it is, ine, ends in ne. And I often wonder if that isn't where it came from. It's just, you know, the, the last half of ine, ne. Um, Nobody can tell you the reason for that. Only it's not from, you know, that's one of the things that's not from the same family. The Romance languages all have C or we. Um, what's the, well, the German, ja, is so close to yes that yeah. that's very easy. Um, ne, it, um, all I can tell you is that they usually say it twice, ne, ne. <laughs> and and the, instead of nodding, ne, they, one beautiful downward curve of the chin. I'm sure there are Greeks here who will demonstrate that for you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, you've explained a, a number of your interests, oh, excuse me, um, such as language, travel, the, the Greek language, editing, writing, and so forth. I was wondering if you could comment on which came first. Was it that you read the Greek myths, you read Homer, as a youngster and then said to yourself, I want to learn more about that and that leads to Greece? Or did you want to go to the New Yorker because that's where great writers are and then when you started thinking about writing, maybe you said, well, I'm editing, but why am I editing this way? Is it because of our language came, you know, you could get to the place that you are now in a lot of different routes and I'm just wondering what was the course that that led you to these various places? Reading was the first thing. Um, reading anything. When I was a child, you know, this was my escape. Um, read, reading, I think this is a primary example of escapism in our time, this book. <laughs> and 
I, I just loved, I remember not being able to read and wanting to be able to read. You know, when my mother would send me to school with a list, to, to, she'd send me to the grocery store with a list, and she'd use her cursive writing and tell me, just ask the clerk. And I would say, please print it. And that way I can match up the letters with the cans or whatever they are. She didn't quite understand that request. But I was really eager to learn how to read and have always loved to read. <clears throat> the um, experience with mythology, I, you know, I did not have a lot of that in my background. Um, it was really not until I got to college and I took a course in mythology at Douglas College in my sophomore year and read the Iliad and the Odyssey and translation and a lot of poetry and a lot of criticism. I learned the word archetype for the first time. And I felt it was also when I was just fresh from this Catholic girlhood and I needed something wider. I needed something more open. And the pantheon of Greek gods was, you know, more human. Um, it had just a lot of appeal, and it came with different stories, and it came without guilt. There's a shame culture in it, but not much of a one of guilt. So um, I felt that that would be freeing. When I came to The New Yorker, of course, it was still reading that made me a good copy editor. For a while, copy editing ruined me as a reader. I couldn't read for pleasure. I would copy edit everything that I read. <laughs> But after, you know, and it took a few years to get past that, but I did finally get past it. And studying a foreign language is a way of constantly refreshing your English. You know, studying a foreign language teaches you a lot about English while it's teaching you about the foreign language. Kind of the way hearing someone make a mistake in a foreign language. In English, someone who, whose English is not so good, the kind of mistakes they make teach you about their language, right? And that, that's interesting. So they feed back and forth all the time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is time for one more question, if someone had been hoping to ask and waiting to get up the courage. <laughs> mm. I see a hand. Here it comes. Yeah. Oh, OK. Uh, oh. What occurred to me, um, the perspective that we would go to Greece with might be, you know, having read the classics and things like that. And when applied in the Middle East, that's called Orientalism. You know, there's something bad about going to a place and thinking about its glorious past. And I was just wondering, is it, is there, do the Greeks themselves have the same feeling about the classics that we do, or do they feel you're missing everything that happened in the past, you know, two, two or 3,000 years. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, the Greeks, of course, have great respect for their own heritage. It's a lot, it's very different, I think, to live in a place full of crumbling ruins <laughs> that you have to take care of. Your cultural heritage has to be maintained, and that's work. Um, so, it would be, I'm sure that it feels different for the Greeks, but I also see their pride in it. Um, when I was in Rhodes, I saw every day, you know, works to hold up that wall around the city of Rhodes. And that's only from the Crusades. You know, that's not even really Greek, except that it is now because they own it. And I was also really moved by the site. <clears throat> I mean, you, you say, or somebody said, where can I go where there won't be a lot of tourists? And the answer is not the Acropolis. <laughs> but the last time I was there, I found that I could look beyond my um, inability to picture the Parthenon and the buildings on the Acropolis as they had been and watch the people working to shore them up now because that's where our history is now, is in, um, you know, keeping, is in preserving the history. And it's like a form, to me, it's a form of adoration. Thank you. So, thank you. Um, people are pointing that there's somebody who wanted to ask a question. 
I can't see what you're pointing to. Do, do you mind coming to the oh, microphone, he has an please? accent. And this will be the last question, well, Jan. Certainly, I will ask the question, unless if you cover it, because I came about five minutes late, which is typical for a Greek, <laughs> <laughs> uh, about the uh, wine dark uh, sea that you ride. Uh, and then I have a few. I, in fact, uh, I'll tell you, I like the book. I enjoyed it tremendously. Thank I you. learned a lot of different things uh, uh, about language, including about the epithets, the whole issue, and the particles of language. The epithets was intriguing because it reminded me of somebody that gives epithets to everybody that he meets, and in politics especially. Yes, <laughs> yes, know we avoid that. But anyway, we'll go back to the <laughs> wine. <laughs> um, epithets are, uh, epithet just means adjective in modern Greek, but um, the gentleman is referring to epithets like gray-eyed Athena, wine-dark sea, uh, rosy-fingered dawn. And I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because I neglected to mention it when we were talking about the sea. Um, those epithets, I seem to me, you know, people are still arguing about what they mean. And wine-dark sea, you wonder, well, you look at wine, it's purple, it's white. Why is it wine dark, the sea? The sea is blue. And it was that first trip to the Aegean when I was on a little boat going, I, th I think I was between Chios and Lesvos, or, and I was just staring into the sea. I did have a glass of ouzo in my hand, I confess. <laughs> and I, I understood that the wine dark refers not to the color of the sea, but to the depths of the sea, as if you know, you're looking into your wine and, and having dreams. And so it's not, it, it's not talking, well, it's, it's like almost wine depth sea, the darkness of the sea under its surface, its depths, that is, is mesmerizing when you look at it. And it's both beautiful and dangerous, I think. Um, somebody who knows a lot more about the epics than I do has said that um, Homer only calls the sea wine dark when they're about to go off into some dangerous place that they haven't been before. I have a theory about Rosy Fingered Dawn, too. You know, um, the um, uh, Red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky at morning, sailors take warning. I've always meant to reread the epic and see when the, they said the sky was red if a storm came later in the day. <laughs> I think, I think specifically, uh, I don't know. I know, of course, the Rhododactylus and all this, but what is the word for the wine dark sea? I don't know. I didn't know. Enopsis, I never. Enopsis, Enopsis, O I N O P S I S, Enopsis. Okay. Eno, wine. Yes, yes. The, the end of the word means face. Face. Yes. So <laughs> there are also theories that it's um, how you look when you're hungover. <laughs> 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 bloodshot, the bloodshot sea. <laughs> So this is a perfect time to say, if you want to learn more, read the book. <laughs> it is full of these kinds of insights and, um, sense, and, and depth and sensitivity and beautiful writing. And thank you so much for well, thank you, writing it. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.